Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm Christopher Brown. Today, we take you to the heart of downtown Calgary, where this past weekend, a significant event unfolded at this year's Federation of Canadian Municipalities Convention. The convention, a pivotal gathering for municipal leaders from across this great nation, had a speech to delegates from Green Party of Canada co-leader Elizabeth May. As hundreds of municipal leaders, city officials, and local government officials gathered in the bustling conference halls at the TELUS Convention Centre, May spoke to the attendees about wanting to work in partnership with municipalities at a federal level. The appearance was moderated by outgoing mayor of Halifax, Mike Savage. Good morning, everybody. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to introduce our next political keynote, that being Elizabeth May. Carol said that we were lifelong friends. Well, no, we're not lifelong friends, and our life isn't over yet. By the way, by the way, the woman that comes out here next turns 70 tomorrow, so when she comes out, feel free to sing happy birthday to Elizabeth May. I have known Elizabeth for a while, though. You know, she got her start in activism in the great province of Nova Scotia. En tant que chef de Parti Vé de Canada, je sais qu'elle doit apprécier Le thème de Congrès de cette année, Redéfinir notre avenir. Elizabeth and her party have a deep understanding of the impact that municipalities can make by implementing meaningful environmental policy and always balancing it with social justice. As municipalities, we're in a very special position to take decisions for a cleaner, more emissions-free future. And more than ever, the roles that municipalities can play in adopting sustainable and innovative programs is clear. Just look at the inroads made by FCM's own Green Municipal Fund in supporting local solutions to the country. So I'm very happy. Quick story. In 2021, Carol and I and Anders from FCM were at Glasgow for COP26. It was a difficult time. Travel was hard because we were in the pandemic. And I remember the first day we went down to the, the Canada Roundtable with the Minister of Environment and other uh, folks from the NGO community. We sat down and the door opened and Elizabeth May walked in. It could have been Queen Elizabeth. She walked in. I think she had a cane that day. She was hobbled a little bit. And because accommodations were hard, she had to take three buses, two carts and a horse to even to get to the, to the site. But she was there because she is such a battler for the cause. So I'm really happy to have the opportunity to introduce her to the main stage of FCM's annual conference this morning for her keynote remarks. And shortly after that, another Nova Scotian, our new uh, FCM president-to-be, Jeff Stewart, will have a conversation with her. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a champion of sustainability, justice, and a better Canada for all. Please welcome the birthday girl, Elizabeth May. <laughs> Mon Dieu, tellement gentil, mon vrai ami. Mike, I always say to Mike, I don't know how it. Oh. Oh, merci, merci. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. I was. I'm turning 70 tomorrow. I never thought when I was 20, I didn't think 70 would feel like this. Mike's right. I was using a cane in Glasgow because I'd had knee surgery. Then I had a stroke last year. I'm fine. Like you see, I had to dance a bit when I got near Mike. Um, I'm more blessed and more lucky and happier than I've ever been in my life. And one might wonder, have I? That's a sure sign of losing a grip on reality. <laughs> I'm. I, I'm leader of a federal political party. I'm in the most toxic parliament we've ever seen. And we're facing a world of poly crises. I will say first off that I'm honored to be on the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, uh, the Métis of Alberta Districts 5 and 6, Treaty 7 of the southern regions of Alberta. And I know there are many, many other ways that I can say, and in the language where Mike started, of the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Passamaquoddy people, I say to him and to all of you, Walalan, thank you. I'm honored to be here. Some people thought, well, again, losing grip on reality. Why would I run for leader of the Green Party again? 
clearly because I missed the chance to speak at FCM. It was the number one reason. And I'm glad to be back as I was last year when you were all in Toronto. Local governments do the work. You do the work. And as that last wonderful panel of rural representatives talking about how you cope in a climate emergency and extreme weather event makes it really clear. I know if you were, some of you may have missed it when Brian talked about what happened in Lytton, that not only did the brand new fire truck that they had in the fire station burn up before they could get it out of the fire station, they lost all their bylaws, had to have new bylaws written up so they would have the power to spend any money. When you talk about what it's really like, and totally true, in situations of extreme weather events, the first responders are your neighbors, no matter where you are, and our social cohesion as a country is our superpower. Our ability to work together no matter what is what will save lives, save property, rebuild. Governments are great. I'm not against, I'm, I'm a, I believe in democracy, which means I believe that our ability as citizens to influence our future at the end of our fingertips is where our government is and we should be in control of it. So, c'est pour, pour le thème d'aujourd'hui, Et pour cette conférence, tellement important, redéfinir notre avenir, je vais ajouter peut-être redéfinir notre pays. I am constantly struggling with the question of, why can't we all get along? <laughs> you see, I work in Parliament. Why can't we all work together? That's who we are as Canadians, and we know it. I always turn my mind to the European Union. Why? Well, we just observed the 70th anniversary of D-Day. My husband, by the way, that's one reason I'm so happy. I've been married five whole years, first time in my life. Oh, he's such a cutie, John Kidder, but he's not here. Anyway, his dad was one of the invasion force in the Canadian forces at D-Day. European Union is a functional, multilateral organization made up of countries that, at least some of whom, were trying to destroy each other just that long ago in the lifetime of the memory of a family. England, France, Germany. Well, England left. That was thanks to use of algorithms and rage farming, but never mind. France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, 27 separate sovereign nation states with 27 different official languages. Do you know what they coordinate better? When Russia invaded Ukraine, it was a matter of months. The European Union said to itself and said out loud, Ukraine's going to need energy. We better make sure we can plug Ukraine into the EU electricity grid. There is an EU electricity grid. And they did it. Within months, they plugged Ukraine into an EU electricity grid. Try to imagine that in Canada. BC was never, in fact, at war with Alberta. And yet, Hydro-Quebec has enough energy for all of Atlantic Canada, but you can't plug Hydro-Quebec into Atlantic Canada, so Nova Scotia is still burning coal. This makes no sense. If we could think like a country and we could re-imagine ourselves as a country that pulled together. Fundamental to this point is what the hell why are we still in Queen Victoria's hand-me-downs? They don't fit the 1867 <laughs> version of Canada, right? 1867 Canada, imagined in England and written up for us in the British North America Act. Local governments, municipalities, are the children of provinces. And that's still how the Constitution is supposed to work? Makes no sense. You do all the heavy work, all the heavy lifting. And by the way, just as a check here, I know this is probably too much information. How many of us here in this room didn't have a shower in solidarity with, Ca with Calgary and Mayor Gondick this morning? Hands up if you didn't. All right. It's not the kind of information you usually want to share, but we can still hug in close. The point is, a major catastrophic water main had a catastrophic failure in the city of Calgary. We've been talking for how long about aging infrastructure, about deferred maintenance, about not having adequate funding for the infrastructure deficit, for how, I remember talking about the threat 
of climate change and the pressure it would put on aging infrastructure, when I was meeting with Paul Martin back when he was Minister of Finance, we're talking the late 19, we've been talking about this a long time. So I was thinking about this. What are the chances of the largest gathering that Federation of Canadian Municipalities has ever had is happening in a city that just had aging infrastructure collapse to the point that they may run out of water, right? You've heard the quote before, I looked it up. It wasn't Winston Churchill. It was, it was Saul Alinsky in a book called Rules for Radicals. Never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> Time to say out really loudly that it is not right children are not, <laughs> provinces are not our parents of local governments. Local governments are not children of provinces. And to make it worse, what the hell? Oh, Daniel Smith, I used to have fun with her. We were once on a pancake line together at Calgary Stampede. We can work well together when hot things are involved in pancake batter. But I knew Peter Lougheed a lot. What a, what a statesman. I, I knew Jim Prentice. I loved Jim Prentice. But I mean, God, Daniel Smith's making me nostalgic for Ralph Klein. <laughs> She, she has a new twist on local governments are the children of provinces. Bad, bad children. To bed without dinner and I'm cutting off your allowance. We have to be really clear as Canadians that we have to rethink how confederation works to live with what our real values are is can, as Canadians is that we pull together our lovely MC here, Catherine Clark. Remember when her dad, first Canadian prime minister from Alberta, said we are a community of communities. That's who we are. We care about each other. We love each other. We take care of each other. <sighs> we pull together in crisis. And there have been so many different crises hitting so many different communities. And we have to be able to rethink it without opening up the Constitution. So I've been pushing this, the Green Party has been pushing this for election after election to pick up on an idea that comes from Australia, which is one of the only countries in the Commonwealth of Nations that has the Westminster system of government and a structure kind of like Canada, a federal government and powerful subnational governments as states. They created to give a seat at the table for local governments, the Council of Australian governments, federal, state, and local at the same table. Greens want this to be a circle with four sections looking like a medicine wheel. Federal, provincial, territorial, local governments, rural and urban, and indigenous governments at the same table. So we have policy coherence, policy alignment, and that dollar, you know, there's, it's axiomatic, there's only one taxpayer. What if we weren't spending money heading in opposite directions? What if we were all rowing in the same direction, spending dollars to achieve goals that we'd agreed on by consensus nationally and recognizing that it's time to stop treating local councils, municipal or village, urban or rural as less than what you are. Essential partners in the future of Canada without which we have no future. Let's put power where it belongs with the people. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Hi, hi. Well, there don't you go, Elizabeth Don't waste May. a drop. Don't waste a drop. <laughs> A standing ovation for your birthday. Congratulations. Elizabeth May has never given a boring speech in her entire life. <laughs> and we are absolutely thrilled to, uh, to hear from her this morning. And right, right now, as Mike Savage noted, uh, you'll see that Elizabeth has taken a seat here on stage. And that's because I'm happy to introduce FCM's first vice president, Jeff Stewart. He's going to be joining us out here for a fireside chat with Elizabeth May, which I know we're all looking forward to. So Jeff, come on out and thank you again and happy birthday, Elizabeth.
Well, first of all, Elizabeth, happy birthday. Thank you so much. I, I'm not one of those people who doesn't like birthdays, and I'm not one of those people who's afraid to mention their age, because it sure beats the alternative. <laughs> and, and thank you very much for your remarks and sitting down to discuss some of the issues in depth with us here today. We want to start by thanking you for making it a priority to connect with the municipal elected officials year after year. It is very much appreciated. Thank you. I want to start with something that's top of mind as we go into the summer. Municipalities are working hard to protect our residents from climate-related events like floods, wildfires, and drought. We've, all, we've seen all too well what can happen when our infrastructure fails to withstand extreme weather. How can we work together to better protect Canadian communities from climate-related disasters? Thank you, Jeff, and it's an honor, and believe me, it's always my honor to meet with municipal leadership. To talk about, briefly, talking about Barbara Roden, who's the mayor of Ashcroft and head of the regional district there, and I touch base with her whenever we're there. She was like, we were talking about dealing with extreme weather events when realizing when they were on evacuation alert for fire, and she realized, okay, so we better figure out if we can get people out of seniors' residences, and we better get school buses organized. And that's when she discovered, and I'm, I'm sure you've probably thought about it, all of you, but if, it, if some of the school districts weren't insuring the school buses in the summer when they weren't used to take the kids to school. So one of the things that I plead with the federal government with a lot, and I meet regularly, it used to be Bill Blair, Minister of Emergency Preparedness, and now it's Harjit Sajan, Minister of Emergency Preparedness. You couldn't find two finer human beings on this earth, I have to say. I mean, you've got Bill, who was a former police chief, and Harjit, who was a in our military and served so valiantly. And here they are stuck in politics, which is really beneath them. But in any case, I, I, I beg them all the time, sit down and talk to all different levels of government. Talk to all, excuse me, I've corrected my language years ago, orders of government. Talk to all different orders of government and learn things. We've got to share information. Every community that goes through an extreme weather event has learned something that we all need to share. But then you've got the jurisdictional barriers. Can a Minister of Emergency Preparedness sit down regularly with municipal leadership? I've been asking them to create a permanent sitting working group that involves Fed, Prov, territorial, local governments, and First Nations to see what did we learn. A lot of people don't realize how many extreme weather events have hit Alberta over the years. Do you know the first $1 billion extreme weather event in Canadian history was in Edmonton in 1987. It was the tornado that hit the trailer park. And of course, I will never forget, I went into High River and pulled stuff out of people's basements when I was at Calgary Stampede, but we had the, the, the floods of 2013 and then the Fort McMurray fire of 2016. So to prepare for what is coming and is not going to slow down. We have to tell the truth about the climate crisis. Even if we went cold turkey on fossil fuels tomorrow, everything is going to keep getting worse year on year and we have to be prepared. Secondly, if we don't cut back on our fossil fuels, if we don't transition away from fossil fuels dramatically, we'll have the kind of climate events from which we don't recover and which destroy human civilization. Don't like saying that out loud, but it's the truth. So we have to prepare. We have to get rid of the silos and the barriers. We have to empower volunteers in every community and make sure that local government and provincial governments aren't afraid to empower volunteers to go out and save each other for fear of insurance liability, legal problems. We need training and certification and every community needs to work with every other community and share the learned experiences. Well, thank you. And I'd, I'd like to touch on, and you're very much aware of the housing crisis that we're seeing in the communities across this country. Many municipalities are taking a leadership, not only to increase housing supply, but to expand affordable housing and tackle the chronic homelessness. One of our biggest strengths is our ability to bring local partners to the ground and deliver solutions. We recognize that all orders of government have more to do, and we're looking to deepen our partnerships with federal, provincial, and territorial governments to ensure we're rowing in the same direction. 
Part of our role is to enable housing by expanding core infrastructure and maintaining what we already have for existing residents. How will you and your party work with us to ensure communities of all sizes have the support they need to maintain and expand core infrastructure, including water, sanitation, roads, transit, community centers, and so much more? Well, it's clear we need a new funding formula across many areas of concern. Housing is a current and immediate crisis. We also need to face the structural problems. Sometimes you've got, for instance, like the regional district of Waterloo has several municipalities within it. Same thing for much of the country. It happens particularly in Ontario. If you, we have to make sure that the funding formulas the federal government creates for assisting in affordable housing isn't only available to cities if that precludes funding to a region and the region is doing most of the affordable housing building. So we have to make sure every funding formula is fit for purpose and gets the money where it needs to go. As Greens, we're big believers in getting private investors out of housing, speculative profit-making motives. Homes are for people to live in, not for people to make money out of through speculative investments. And we need co-ops. We need a lot more co-ops. Thank you. And you, you touched on that. And the next topic falls right in line with what you were just talking about. And the issues we've discussed become even more pressing when you consider that Canada's communities are experiencing record growth. Over 1 million people alone last year. So we do... So how do we ensure that they remain great places to live? FCM has just launched a new paper that shows a new municipal growth frame framework is key to addressing Canada's housing crisis and ensuring all Canadians receive the level of services and infrastructure they deserve. A mid-record national population growth, our outdated fiscal framework is holding us back. While new federal funding for infrastructure and housing is welcome, we need longer term solutions. Flexibility and local decision making will be key. FCM proudly represents communities of all sizes in all regions of this country, from rural areas to small towns, mid sized communities, and biggest cities. Their local realities are diverse but they each have an important role to play in making this country a great, place to, a great place to live. How can we work together across orders of government to develop a sustainable growth framework that will support communities of all sizes to meet the challenges of today and build better lives for Canadians? We're calling for the federal government to initiate a critical first step in their 2024 fall economic statement to increase direct annual transfers to municipalities by 2.6 billion and link them to economic growth. Are you open to a further conversation on how we can move this forward? Jeff, the only thing I disagree with in what you just said is that 2.6 billion isn't enough. Not close. We have to thought, we have to really think about as Canadians how we can be one of the wealthiest countries on earth and allow people to be living in tent cities because they can't find a roof over their head. We should eliminate poverty in this country because we have two different kinds of housing crises. We have the acute problem of people not having a roof over their head, and we have the deep, and it really causes stress and grief for so many people to think, I don't see me, myself ever being able to afford to buy a house. How can I start a family if I don't think I can afford to buy a house? So the affordability crisis needs to be dealt with as an urgent crisis. This is why I use the word poly crisis, by the way. There are so many things coming at us all at once, and it means we have to, every solution we come up with, for one, has to actually work in a synergistic way to alleviate pressure on the others. Everything has to be dealt with at once. We don't have the luxury of dealing with climate change sequentially from poverty, sequentially from geopolitical stress and what the hell Vladimir Putin and don't even. So we have to figure this stuff out and we have to make it a priority immediately. The local order of government we know delivers. Stephen Harper found that out when we had the 2018 financial crisis. He figured it out, no, that Tuesday, 2008, excuse me, I missed a digit. 2008 financial crisis, the shovel ready projects, I can remember John Baird saying there's no better partner that he'd ever seen than municipal, municipal governments picked it up and started delivering. So we need to reduce the silos. We need to increase the amount of money. And frankly, Jeff, since you're also from Nova Scotia and Mike was, do you know that, I'm sorry, I'm going to rant a little bit. 
being a former Nova Scotian and now Vancouver Islander, the first social housing built in Canada was a result of the Halifax explosion, 1917. Thousands of people were suddenly homeless. We didn't wait around for the private sector to build them homes or they'd still be sheltering in the cold. Thousands of units were built quickly because governments did it. They weren't pretty necessarily, they were tenement housing, but by that winter, within three months, there weren't any Nova Scotians who'd lost their homes because of the single biggest man-made explosion that ever happened before Hiroshima. Everybody was sheltered. Now that kind of, it's a crisis, it's an emergency mentality, does not seem to be with any order of government right now, particularly federal, provincial, and everywhere, to make sure that people living in tent cities, because they can't afford a home, are have a chance immediately to be somewhere that offers security, wraparound social services, mental health and addiction counseling, everything they need. Meanwhile, the building of the homes and the point you make that there's infrastructure there, that there's water, there's sewage, there's roads. We've also got the infrastructure deficit that I started with. We know the infrastructure is aging. That's gonna take creativity and breaking down the silos and everybody working together. And I know we can do it because we've done it before and things that have worked in practice should work in theory. Well, thank, thank you very much, Elizabeth. We've come to the end of our time. I do want to say thank you very much for being here, for having your insight, for being a friend of FCM and being here every year for our conference and having the conversation with our members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Forgive me for saying this to all of you. God bless you and your communities and hold on to each other. Good times are ahead, but there's rough waters between us and where we have to land on a safe shore. God bless you and all of your work. Thank you. After the speech and meeting with the FCM board, we chatted with Elizabeth May regarding her vision for working with municipalities. Elizabeth, thank you so much for doing this. You just got out of your meeting with FCM board, with some of the representatives from FCM. How'd that go? Oh, great. I, it's always an honor to meet with the leadership of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Uh, these are such hardworking folks, the mayors and council members across this country at the local government level. As I was saying in my speech, they do, all the, they do a lot of heavy lifting and they don't get a lot of thanks. In your speech to the conference, you talked about the four medicine wheel, that you're hoping to have a better relationship between provinces, territorials, indigenous municipalities and the federal government. Are you optimistic that that can happen? It can happen. It just takes governments deciding they want to do it. It doesn't reopen the Constitution, which I, mean, I know some people think we ought to reopen the Constitution. I mean, it's a, it was a, a snapshot of Canada in 1867 when most Canadians lived in rural areas. Uh, there wasn't much of a population that lived in cities, but so it's the opposite now. We're largely an urban nation in terms of the population, but the taxing structure and the powers are not with the local governments, and so it needs a fix. I think the fix, and I was turned on to this by a um, former Green Party candidate, quite super smart uh, woman named Deborah Coyne, and Deborah Coyne pointed out what was going on in Australia, which is the Council of Australian Governments, which is what we're describing as Greens. The only thing we add is that rather than just than getting the provincial, which is Australia, state government level, federal government level, local governments, um, that's what's Australian's Council of Australian Governments. Uh, we want to add seats at the table that represent First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. Uh, and obviously there's going to have to be a way that you boil it down. Not every mayor's at the table. Not every premier's always at the table. But something that expands the table that we used to think about is calling a first minister's meeting. And really make it a permanent part of decision making by consensus. That will give this country a lot more stability in terms of uh, what are called policy lurches. We tend to throw one government out, a new government comes in and decides to repeal everything the last government did. That's really bad for our economy. It's really high transactional costs, creates a lot of uncertainty. And if we put this in place, I think all parts of our different orders of government will work better together 
if they've worked together more closely to develop common goals. So let's go back to the municipal focus for a second here, but we have municipalities from across this great country, from coast to coast to coast, and they are all as diverse as the people within their own communities. Mm -hmm. You've heard only a select few of what you probably would get if you went to every single one of these municipalities. How do you take this information that you've gathered at FCM and now bring it to a federal stage? Well, I also stop everywhere I travel and meet with with mayors and councils so that to, um, it, it this, you know, trying to be, well, being a good listener is important and recognizing yeah. Yeah. that taking it to, into the House of Commons, a lot of my colleagues in Parliament also listen to their mayors, try to be helpful. I think if we could, my one of my key messages is always, can we take the partisanship out of this? Can we find ways to work together? We used to be better at that as Canadians. I've been working in and around Ottawa since the mid 80s, not in politics, but doing sort of political work for the environmental movement. And gosh, things have gotten much worse. So we need to know how do we work better together and start from what we have in common, um, you know, and as opposed to trying to uh, exaggerate what we have in the difference. And so that's what I do. I try to take it back to Ottawa, find other MPs, regardless of what party they're in, who agree that we should all do this together. Municipalities are finding that partisanship is being leaked into their own field. It's traditionally a nonpartisan arena. When you go to Ottawa and you see the, and I don't want to say dysfunction, but when oh, you talk to you minis- when you talk to municipal leaders, it is dysfunction to them. When you go back to Ottawa and you see that dysfunction, and you want to try and help municipalities overcome their issues, is it challenging? And do you just have to hit your head against the wall sometimes and say, what what's going on in this country? We have to recognize how fortunate we are to be Canadian. And we have to be honest about what's dysfunctional. I firmly believe that we can pull together and work together. And that means that incrementalism is our enemy. Tweaking around the margins with little tiny changes is not, it's not what meets the moment. What's going to meet the moment is transformational change. That's why I'm advocating so forcefully for a council of Canadian governments. Meet around the same table, come to a shared decision. It doesn't require opening the Constitution. It just says, we're going to work together. Let's all agree on some shared goals. Let's just try it for a bit, see what happens. So my final question is about infrastructure, because you talked to any municipal leader, and you probably heard it there. You mentioned it in your speech. Yeah. Infrastructure is a big concern to a lot of municipalities right now, especially the smaller rural yeah. communities. How does the Green Party advocate for smaller communities on in, around issues around infrastructure? Well, absolutely, we need to make sure that every um, town, city, village, <laughs> the, the local governments of this country need to have a voice at the table in establishing the programs and the priorities. They have to meet the needs. It's a, you know, I represent a largely rural riding, Saanich Gulf Islands. We have so many different forms of local government. Many of the people in my uh, district, the electoral district of Saanich Gulf Islands, are represented through uh, a, a form of government called the um, Islands Trust, that's their municipal government, doesn't have access to funding on almost anything where cities are allowed to apply for funding. We actually have to look for, on behalf of every community, do you have access to the funding you need? How do we simplify that so that you're, you know, I talked to local mayors you know, a while ago and I found that there was huge competition between municipalities for guess what? Hiring grant writers. You want to hire a good grant writer because you got to get a grant to get anything done. This is just foolishness. Why waste everybody's time trying to hire a grant writer? It should be predictable, accessible funding to meet the needs of Canadians. We don't need to create additional red tape 
and new hoops to get to what we know if we don't fund infrastructure and fix old infrastructure, we could have catastrophic events. I mean, I hate to mention, we don't want a bridge collapsing with lots of people driving across it. We don't want a water main breaking, so a city like Calgary runs the risk of running out of water. We, inf- we And we certainly don't want sewage systems that no longer work because of climate deluge water events that dump raw sewage down a river. We have emergency needs. But we're thinking as though we have all that we act like we have all the time in the world. Every time someone says it's an emergency, someone else hits the snooze button. So we're going to say, look, wake up, work together. We can get through this. There's no need to panic, but don't go back to sleep. Now, before we let you go, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities for allowing us to attend this year's convention here in beautiful Calgary, Alberta. This episode would not have been possible without their support. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now, wherever you're watching this or listening to this. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs from coast to coast to coast. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.